We are Life Church Livonia. All right. Good morning, Life Church Livonia. How is everyone today? It is Easter, my friends. It is my favorite day of the entire year, and I am so grateful that you chose to be here uh, with us today at Life Church Livonia. Uh, I'm so excited about uh, what God's doing here in this place, and I cannot wait to continue worshiping with you guys uh, this morning and in the weeks and months to come. And so thank you so much for uh, being a part of our family today. And uh, as we get to really celebrate uh, the greatest comeback in the history of the world, right? The greatest comeback in the history of the world. This is like a, the, the, a, the rush the floor moment, but times 1,000 uh, for us uh, of, of what we celebrate here at Easter. Because uh, he's risen. And this is the beauty of today uh, is the comeback, the victory of Jesus over death. Yeah. The comeback uh, uh, that, that honestly shocked the, everyone but God. Right? <laughs> everyone but God was surprised at this. Uh, the, uh, his closest followers were, were surprised. The Roman government was rocked as a result of it. Um, even Jesus' mom was surprised at what happened. And if you can pull one over on your mom, you know, it's a big surprise. And I'll tell you who was the most surprised was Satan. He thought he had won, and he hadn't even come close. There was a greatest comeback that has ever been and will ever be is Jesus rising from the dead on Easter and leaving an empty tomb behind. That is why we are here today. It is uh, this, this beautiful uh, culmination of ministry where, where everyone thought that hope had died on the cross, but instead uh, it, it actually uh, found its fulfillment in the empty tomb. And it started this, 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 it was this kind of chain of events, this, this new momentum, this new movement where Jesus' followers, his closest followers, were set on fire with hope and love and grace and with truth. And, and, it, and it propelled them into this brand new life that, that none of them had ever experienced before and, and caused them to start this movement that we today call the church. It all started as a result of Easter. If Easter hadn't have happened, we wouldn't be here today. None of this would have happened. The empty tomb was the catalyst for all the things that would come after that. The catalyst for the very church that we're a part of today. And over the, the last 2,000 years, the way that we do church has changed dramatically. It is so different than what it would have been a couple of thousand years ago for so many different reasons. Because what we do is we, is we tailor uh, the systems that we live into here, the, the religious systems that we, that we uh, kind of build up as a framework around the good news uh, in such a way as to, to best uh, share the good news of the empty tomb, the best to share the good news of Jesus' ability to give us freedom and life and hope. We, we set up our systems uh, around all those things to make sure that, that nothing stands as a barrier between people and Jesus. We want to remove as many of those barriers as we possibly can. Because this is so much more than a religion. This is, this is something more than just a system. It's, it's a relationship with God that is made possible through Jesus Christ. So today we start a brand new series and we're calling it Goodbye Religion. But we're not saying uh, goodbye to, to religion because if that was the case, we wouldn't be here today. We're saying goodbye to the, to the systems that we build up around our faith that cause us to, to struggle to share our faith. We're saying goodbye to the systems that we built up to the point where we worship them more than we worship God. We have to let go of those things in order to allow the good news to be propelled forward. In every generation, we come to a spot where we begin to realize this. We say, okay, we've worked really hard to create church, to do church in such a way that, that people can receive the good news of Jesus, but there's some things that have grown stale. There's some things that have grown calcified, and we have to uh, look at those systems, and we have to say, what do we need to let go of to move forward? And so we change things. We change music. We change the way we preach sermons. We, we change the, the type of building we meet in. For crying out loud, we meet in a school, friends. And people are meeting Jesus in a school. People are being baptized in a school. People's lives are being transformed in a school. We don't even have any stained glass. How can it be church? Churches don't even put stained glass in their buildings anymore. You want to know why? Insurance. 
It's too expensive to insure the stained glass. And they want him to like cover it with this plastic film in case it breaks and then it won't fall on the people. And so, so people are like, listen, it, that it's, it's, it's too expensive and it's become a barrier. We're just going to remove it. We'll meet in a school and share the good news wherever we're at. Our dress code has changed. I'm sorry that I'm not Eastery enough. I'm wearing gray. It's because I purged my closet trying to give things away, and I gave away every Eastery shirt. I'm sorry. So if someone has an Eastery shirt they want to donate to the cause, let me know. I'll wear it at the end of the service. Make sure you leave with a shirt on, though, okay? We change things. We adapt. We adjust. Because we want to remove the barriers between people and the good news. And there's things we have to say goodbye to, things that we maybe were accustomed to or felt comfortable Um, but they're important to let go of. And even so, no matter how much we do that, there's still resistance to the good news. There's still resistance to Jesus. There's still resistance to church. And oftentimes I, I shake my head in wonder and think, how could that be? Because at the core of of who we are, at the core of who God calls us to be, is, is something so beautiful, something so simple, that it should be irresistible. What is Christianity built around? It's built around a concept of love. Jesus himself said, the most important thing you could do is love. Love for one another. Uh, love, Love from God to us. Love back to God from us. Love even for our enemies? That sounds amazing and irresistible and something that everyone would be a, want to be a part of, it, but yet there's still some resistance. Uh, Christians should be uh, uh, like sought after. We should be in a situation where everyone, when the house next to them sells, even if they're not a follower of Jesus, they should be saying to themselves, I really hope a Christian moves in next door. Because everyone knows Christians make the best neighbors, Right? They're more gracious, they're more kind, they're more loving. They sometimes mow my lawn for me just because they want to serve. When you apply for a job, uh, no matter what, what faith you're part of, people should long to have a boss that's a Christian. You're like, Those are the, Christians make the best bosses. They're more understanding. They, they value me as a human being. And they see that I have dignity and value and worth outside of what I produce at my job. And they, they're, they're, they're full of forgiveness and grace. People should be fighting over Christian spouses. Because everyone knows that Christian spouses are the best spouses, right? They, they forgive. They let go of things. They love. There's this mutual submission thing going on that's so beautiful. People should be saying, man, I hope my, my daughter marries a Christian, even if they're not a Christian. But they're not. There's some resistance there. There's something that, that, that prevents. And there's, there's a whole host. We can give a list of things that, that create resistance to the good news. Not the least of which is the enemy who was most shocked and surprised out of anyone that Jesus rose again from the dead. But some of the, the resistance comes not from the message, not from uh, Jesus himself, but it's resistance against the systems and the structures of religion that we've set up around us. It's resistance to the, the way that we, we proclaim the gospel more than the gospel itself. So what I want to talk about today is, is, is everything surrounding a question uh, that I think that is important for us to ask to ourselves. What are we holding on to? Because I think one of the issues is that we are still holding on to things that are holding us back. What are we personally holding on to that's holding us back from the expansion of the gospel, the sharing, the proclaiming of the good news? And my hope, my hope is that throughout the course of this series, that what we would do is that we would would have an opportunity to look at the first century church, the very first followers of Jesus that ever gathered, and look at what, what they had to let go of in order to live fully into this calling that Jesus had given them, to proclaim the good news. What did the the very first church have to let go of from their religious systems, from their religious background, in order to live fully into who God called them to be? Because I believe that if we can identify what they had to let go of, it will actually trigger in us uh, ideas and thoughts and movement of what we ourselves need to let go of. And when we let go of those things, uh, everything changes for us. Because when we let go of those structures and those systems, what we grab onto is Jesus. 
Jesus alone. And when we do that, everything changes inside of us and around us, in our church, in our homes, at our places of employment. And the very first thing that we're going to talk about today that I believe that we need to say goodbye to isn't an external structure of the church. It's an internal function of the heart. It's an attitude of the heart. It's a reality in our soul. The very first thing that that these early followers of Jesus had to say goodbye to was sin and shame. They had to learn to say goodbye to sin and shame. And everybody struggles with this. This is, a, this is not a, a, a situation that's unique to uh, uh, one individual. It is our common story. And we, when we talk about sin, and, we, and, and wh- what we mean by that is that it's, it's when we live in a way that doesn't line up with God's perfect plan for us. When we live in such a way that we step outside of the guidelines and and the rules and the design that God has put in place for us. It's when we we, want to do the right thing, but we struggle and we don't. We want to think the right thing, but instead we think about all the wrong things. We want to be the right kind of person, but instead we live in old habits and old patterns and we find ourselves failing and struggling And then not just failing, but then wrestling with that failure because it adds on to us guilt and shame that we struggle to get rid of. This is a common human problem that every single person, every single person struggles with. And the early church had to struggle with how do we say goodbye to sin, the failures that we have in our life, the struggles that we have in our life, and the shame that that accompanies it. How do we let go of those things? And, and, and really, honestly, there's, there's only a couple of options. There's only a couple of options to find freedom from sin and shame. The, the first one is this, that we, could, we can change our morality to fit our sin. That's your first option. Uh, you're feeling guilty about the things you're doing or the way you're acting or the things you've said or the things you've done and, and, and you're struggling with that guilt and you're struggling with that shame and you're saying, well, man, I'm really tired of feeling this way. And so one of your options is to say, I'm just gonna decide that what I'm doing isn't wrong. And if I decide that what I'm doing isn't wrong, then I'll feel better about what I'm doing. And then we surround ourselves with people that agree with us. And the problem is, is that it doesn't work. It works really uh, temporarily because what it does is it assuages our guilt in that moment over what we've just done, but then something else happens and we have to expand our list of what's okay to do. It's a slippery slope that, that grows and grows and grows to the point where there is no, uh, there's no activity or no thinking or, or nothing that we could do or say that is wrong because the list has grown to encompass anything that we feel fit to do. And what happens is anarchy. Anarchy, not just in our, in our culture, but in our internal being. Chaos inside of us. Because we've, we've decided there is no right or wrong as a, as a mechanism to help us deal with our guilt and our shame. First option is we can change our morality to fit our sin, and it is a terrible option. The second is to find a religion that promises forgiveness. Find some kind of faith structure that promises to give us forgiveness. And ultimately, all of those religious systems that were in place when Jesus came, every single one of them did this. They promised this somehow. They would say, come to us, follow these steps, do this activity, and you will be forgiven. You'll be right with with God or the gods or whatever they, uh, their, their particular faith believed in. But it was always people coming to the temple or coming to uh, this, this, this gathering or coming to this wise person and doing something in order to receive back from them forgiveness. And it was always temporary. You had to do it over and over and over and over again. Repeat, every time you struggled, every time you screwed up, every time you stepped into sin and failure, you'd have to go back and repeat whatever it was you did in order to be in a place where you were right with God, to let go of your sin and your shame. 
And even the Jewish sacrificial system was repetitive in that way. Even the, the Jewish system that Jesus grew up in, this was the system that, that he was taught, that was given to them by God. Even that system was temporary. But then Easter came. And Easter changed everything. And Hebrews chapter 10 talks about that old system, the system that Jesus grew up in. And this is what it says about it. The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. A, a dim, a shadow, a dim preview. What I want you to imagine is that, is that you've never in your entire life ever had an opportunity to watch a complete motion picture. The only opportunity you've ever had to see a film it was a really grainy, terrible resolution trailer for the film. Imagine that. Think of your favorite movie of all time, your list of favorite movies of all time. Now imagine that you've only ever seen a blurry, fuzzy, aged trailer. Would it still have the same level of power to move you? To, change, to, to, to brighten your day or cause you to think? No, it wouldn't because it's only a dim preview of what the real thing is. And, and friends, I believe that, that when we come to church but don't experience Jesus, don't have a relationship with Jesus, it's just like that. We see a dim preview of what could be. So my hope today is that as we, as we kind of step into this, this, this idea of saying goodbye to sin and shame, that you would personally have an opportunity to experience Jesus for yourself, to see the fullness of what it could be. And we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about what that might look like. My prayer is that you would leave here today with a different perspective on life. Because this old system that Jesus stepped into, it wasn't sufficient to permanently remove the stain of, of sin and shame from our life because it was simply a preview of, of what was to come. Easter was the full-length movie. The life and death and resurrection of Jesus was a full-length movie. And, and, and Hebrews goes on. Uh, it says, the sacrifices under that system, they were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. I want you to imagine that you, that you are living in this system, that, you're, that you are a part of, of you know, the first century uh, Judaic system of, of sacrifice for your sin. And, and, and I want you to imagine that you don't live uh, in, the, in the same city as the temple. You live maybe in an outlying town. And so it's a, it's a big deal for you to go to the temple, to go before the priest, to offer some kind of a sacrifice. Because that's what they would do. And for some of these people, it, they would go once a year. Or if they were really poor... Maybe not even once a year. So they had all this, this guilt from the sins they'd committed, all this shame that they're carrying, seeking forgiveness, longing for forgiveness, but knowing that the only way they could do it was to make sometimes even a two-day journey to the temple. And they would buy some, some animal like a dove or a goat or sometimes it was, it was a bigger deal. They would, they would bring a, a, a ram or a bull even and that, that, that animal would be sacrificed for their sins. And the priest would go through this process to absolve them of the guilt and the shame of their sin. So I want you to imagine then that you've waited a year for this to happen. And you've gone to the temple and you've taken care of business with God and you're feeling great, right? Because God has, has, has forgiven you and you can feel it. It feels so good to be free. And then you start your journey home. And you get about a day into your journey home and you get a bad case of the idiots, right? And you do something really, really stupid. You get in a fight with your spouse. You say something you never should have said. You do something you never should have done. Or you just lose your cool with your kids because everyone knows that traveling on vacation with your family is not always easy, right? Right? Or maybe you start to run out of food because you didn't pack enough and you steal something because you're hungry. 
You lie to cover it up. And you just left the temple a day ago, freed of guilt and shame, and now you feel it again. What do you do? Do you turn around and go back? You're like, I'm sorry, kids, we're turning the car around, right? We're turning the wagon around or whatever it is, or we're, we're turning our, our self around because we walked here. What do you do? Do you go back? No. You wait till next year. You wait until the next opportunity to travel to the temple to offer a sacrifice. And you carry that guilt and shame all the way until the next year. Jesus came to to cause us, to, to enable us to step out of that system. And yet some of us are still living that way. Still carrying guilt and sin and shame with us when we don't have to. Because that system wasn't everything it needed to be for once in all time. And it goes on and says, but instead of, of removing the guilt, it says those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. It was important. It needed to happen. And, but instead of freeing them from shame and sin once and for all, it reminded them of their struggles. It reminded them of their struggles because, because they were longing to be set free, but they had to wait to be set free. It was a necessary religious system and process, but it was incomplete. It was nece- they needed a way to remove the, 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 the stain of sin and shame, but it was an incomplete system because it had to be repeated over and over again. It was effective, but it was temporary. It was temporary. They, they had to go back and repeat. Same song, second verse, same as the first 20 years of my life. So I want, I want you to imagine, if you lived in that system, would you long for there to be a better way? Would there be something inside of you that thought every year as you, as you walked away from the temple after offering your sacrifice and feeling free, would you, uh, would you come to a spot at some point in your life where you're thinking, God, I would love to feel this way every day. I would love to have access to this kind of freedom from sin and shame every single day of my life. You would long for that. Something deep inside of you would crave that. And Jesus came along, and people began to think, maybe there's another way. Jesus came along, and people began to see what he did and hear what he said, and they began to hope. We think this is the guy. We think this is the one. He's going to change everything. And hope began to build. Hope began to grow. Because Jesus was even saying that that he had the, the power to forgive sin. In Luke chapter 7, during an encounter with a woman who had struggled with sin and shame, he says this, Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say amongst themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? They're like, Who is this guy? And some of them were saying it in amazement with hope growing, and others were saying it with with skepticism, and uh, still others were thinking, Heretic. Only, the only one who can, can forgive sins is God. And Jesus is saying, yeah, that's right. And that made them even angrier. And they're, th- and they're, they're thinking to themselves, uh, they, I felt the weight of sin and shame. I felt the weight of my guilt. And you don't seem sufficient. What you're doing right now doesn't seem sufficient to get me to a space of freedom. But as close as followers believed, The people that that called him rabbi believed. This woman that that sat at his feet believed. And hope grew and built upon itself deeper and deeper and deeper. And one of those people that believed in Jesus with all of his heart was a guy named Peter. Peter. One of his closest companions. He was brave. He was brash. He was, appeared to be fearless. He was a guy that was saying, Jesus, I'll follow you anywhere. You tell me where to go and I'll go. You tell me what to do and I'll do it. You tell me what to say and I'll say it. Je- Jesus gave Peter hope that there was a better way, a different way. But then Jesus was arrested. Then Jesus was placed on trial. Then they killed him. Then they killed Jesus. 
The, everything about that causes Peter's hope to be shattered. And Peter, who was the, who was the one that was, was saying, I'll follow you anywhere, was now the first one to deny that he even knew Jesus. Why would he do that? He did that because his hope was shattered. His dreams of what, what Jesus was bringing were shattered. And I want you to imagine the guilt and the shame that, that Peter would have carried as a result of that failure. It was sin what he did. To promise Jesus one thing and then do the, the complete opposite, it was sin. And Peter would have been carrying guilt and shame that the old system would have been powerless to free him from. He would have been struggling so hard because Peter thought that all hope died with Jesus on the cross. So when he heard that the tomb was empty, three days later, Peter hears that the tomb is empty. What did he do? He ran. He ran. He didn't walk to the empty tomb. He jumped up and ran to the empty tomb to see it for his own eyes. Because he, He's thinking in his, in his mind, maybe it's true. Maybe my hope is not dead. Maybe I'm not trapped in this place of guilt and shame over what I've done and what I failed to do. And, and, and Jesus wasn't there. The tomb was empty. And then you flash forward uh, a little while later uh, in one of the first uh, encounters that, that Peter had an opportunity to have with Jesus now that he's risen from the dead. And Peter's out in this boat and they're fishing because they kind of went back to their old way of living. And on the, on the shore of the lake, uh, Peter sees a guy and he thinks to himself, I think that's Jesus, the risen Lord. I think that's him. And he doesn't even wait for the boat to pull into the water. He jumps into the water and swims to shore because he was desperate to have an encounter with Jesus desperate to be freed of this guilt and this shame. I'm so sorry, Jesus. I denied you. I failed you. I sinned. Carrying this, this burden, this weight of my sin. Carrying the burden and the weight of my shame. What did Jesus do? What did Jesus do when Peter comes dripping out of the lake to see him? Did he make him go to the market and buy a dove for a sacrifice or a goat or a lamb or whatever it might be? Did he say, here's a system and a process you're going to go through to make things right between you and I, between you and God? Did he do all that? No, he didn't do any of that. What did he say? Do you love me, Peter? Peter's like, Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? Or do you know I love you? Jesus says, go and do. Go and live into who I made you to be. You're set free. Because Jesus' love was enough. Jesus' love is what it takes to transform us. It's his love that led him to the cross. And it's his love that, that, that brought him up out of the, the tomb. It's his love that, that allows him to extend that grace and that forgiveness to you and I. And it's his love that, that transformed Peter from the first denier of the faith to the number one proclaimer of the faith. It took this guy named Peter who had been stuck in sin and shame and it set him free so he could proclaim the story of Jesus. This, this guy that, that was afraid to even admit it to a couple of people outside of Jesus' trial was now standing in the central courtyard of cities proclaiming the good news of Jesus. Because he had an encounter with the Lord. It wasn't just a, a, a shaky preview of a movie. He actually met Jesus and found forgiveness and found freedom. And thousands of people, thousands and thousands of people, as a result of that transformation, got to receive forgiveness for their sins as well. Because of the hope of Jesus wasn't just extended to his closest followers. The, the hope that, that Jesus brought wasn't a temporary band-aid to sin and shame. The hope that Jesus brought didn't die with him on the cross. The hope that Jesus brought was, was completed in his resurrection and in the empty tomb and at Easter because he is alive. And because he's alive, we, hope is alive. Because he's alive, forgiveness is alive. Because he is alive, we are alive. This is Easter. This is the good news. 
that because of what Jesus did, offering himself up as a sacrifice, a complete, done, finished for all time sacrifice, because of Jesus, we can say goodbye to sin and shame. And that would have radically changed every single person's idea of what religious systems needed to look like. Transformed them. Easter changed everything. And Hebrews explains it to us in chapter nine. How did it happen? How did it work? For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. He didn't enter into a temple. He entered into heaven. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, he has appeared at the end of this age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice, to remove sin from you and I, to remove sin from Peter, to remove sin from that woman who sat at his feet, to remove sin from anybody, anywhere, in all time, completely and permanently and totally. And when our sin is gone, our shame can go with it. When our sin is gone, our shame can go with it. We don't have to offer sacrifices year after year, friend. We don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops to feel forgiven. We have to step into a relationship with Jesus Christ who died and rose again for you and I, a once for all time sacrifice on our behalf, on my behalf. And all we have to do is choose his love to choose his love and to choose the life that comes with it. Hope didn't die on the cross. It rose on Easter. Hope didn't die on the cross. It rose on Easter. Uh, the, the grace didn't die on the cross. Mercy didn't die on the cross. It rose on Easter. But here we are, thousands of years later, some of us still holding on to things that are holding us back. Still living as if we're under that old rule and that old system. Still living as if Jesus' sacrifice once and for all wasn't sufficient for us. And he looks at us today, he looks at you today, he looks at me today and he says, it is finished. My grace is sufficient for you. My love is sufficient for you. My mercy is sufficient for you. Come to me and find life. Here in a few weeks, we're gonna have a service here and the entire service is built around a baptism. And baptism is an amazing opportunity for us to make a public declaration that we're letting go of the things that are holding us back. It's an amazing opportunity to, to publicly say in front of everyone as, as we baptize you to, to say, I'm identifying uh, with the death and resurrection of Jesus. And as we go under the water, uh, it, it's symbolic of, of us dying to our old way of life, our old sins. As we come up out of the water, it's, it's significant because it's proclaiming that new life has come to you and to I. And my hope, my prayer is that there is someone here today who maybe has been far from God for a really long time and you're hearing this message today and you're realizing Jesus is calling me home. I've been trying to do a system of religion, but what I really need is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And I, my prayer is that there's someone here today that's saying, yes, I want that life. I want that freedom. I want to say goodbye to sin and shame. And my prayer is that, that as you say yes to Jesus, that it would point you towards baptism. And that you would have an opportunity, even this morning, to say goodbye to sin and shame. After we're done with, with the sermon, we're going to have an opportunity for you to, 
to let us know that God did something in your life. And if you right now are feeling like God is tugging you to be baptized, I want you to write that down in your card and put it in the offering when it comes by. Make it a bold proclamation. Make it an opportunity to let go of the things that are holding you back. But first, I want to pray for you. So would you stand with me? Let's pray. Jesus, I am so in awe of you. So in awe of your love and your grace, your mercy. So in awe at the length to which you are willing to go on our behalf. That you are willing to go all the way to the cross and become the sacrifice that we needed once and for all for our sin. For our struggles. For our shame. God, I am in awe that the, that the grave could not contain you. That you shattered everything we know. Everything we understand, God, you shattered it all and you rose again from the dead so that we might have life. And so this morning, Jesus, as, as, I, as I think about this, this group that is here today, I'm convinced that there are people here right now that are far from you, that feel stuck in the burden of their sin and shame. And Jesus, you want to set them free. I'm convinced of it. And so if that is you in this place right now, I just encourage you in the quiet of your own heart to pray with me right now and just come to Jesus and say, I choose your love. I choose your forgiveness. I choose your mercy. I choose your grace. Jesus, I give over to you my failures. I give over to you the shame that I've been carrying. I give over to you my doubt and my struggles. I choose you today. Cleanse me. Purify me. Make me whole today so that I can say goodbye to sin and shame. I trust you, Jesus. And we pray all these things in your name. Amen.